Welcome to Christ Life Today, where we explore the glorious realities of life in Jesus Christ. We are in 1 Peter chapter 2, and we are going to start with uh, verse 16 tonight. Um, so if someone would want to read 16 and 17, that would be good. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Okay, so uh, this is a continuation where we left off uh, last week um, with verse 15, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, that section that we were looking at, kind of, I think it was 13 through 15, talks about submitting to all authorities. And we talked at length about mm -hmm. that. Uh, that was, that was, but we're continuing, so we'll see where we go tonight. But uh, that was the, the gist of it was submitting to all authority because God sets up and takes down all authority. And so... The bottom line that we came away with with those previous verses is that um, God's in control and we are not trusting the authority, we're trusting God. Mm -hmm. And God sets up the authority for his purposes mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and you, we look through the Bible and sometimes those purposes were to correct his people who were in rebellion. Um, uh, so like Israel, Israeli, Israelite captivities to, you know, Babylon and Rome and so on and so forth. Sometimes it was for bringing correction. Sometimes it was because this world is dark with sin, you know. Um, and But we looked at, and I, I, this bears repeating, I think, um, our kind of conclusion last week was instead of looking for loopholes to rebel against authority, we should be looking for opportunities to be able to obey the authority. But we did say that there were a few examples from the Bible, and we looked at a few of them, where uh, godly people rebelled against the authorities. Uh, but there was a common, there was a common thread to those rebellions. Uh, Daniel rebelled against authority because they said, don't pray to God. And Daniel says, sorry, do what you got to do. Uh, but he kept on praying to God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they rebelled because they were told, worship this idol. Nope, not going to do it. They rebelled. Peter, James, John, and the apostles, uh, uh, they were arrested and told not to preach in Jesus' name. And they got right in the authority's face and says, well, you judge for yourself whether it's right for us to obey God or obey you, you know. So the rebellions recorded in the, the, the rebellions recorded in the Bible by godly people were for God's glory and honor. Don't pray to God. Uh, don't preach Jesus, bow to an idol. Well, in all three of those events, I recommend highly rebelling against authority. <laughs> <clears throat> um, but, and, yeah, go ahead. Respect the highest authority. Yeah, respect, yeah, exactly. That's part of my notes for today if we get there. Um, but yeah, respect the highest authority, of course. Uh, but, so... The point of rebellion was direct disobedience against God. It wasn't, it wasn't even against specifically his word because, well, the word of God, you know, tells us not to encroach on our neighbor's property. Well, if the government comes in and exercises eminent domain, are you going to rebel against the government? because they encroached on your property, that's not a hill I'm going to die on. I'm not going to take that fight. I probably won't like it, 
but it's not going to be civil disobedience time. I mean, I'm probably going to get a lawyer and see if I can stop them from taking my property, but I'm not, you know. The other thing about it is, is that um, when they did rebel, they were in, they were fully and completely aware that lions, fiery furnace, and probable death faced them. They chose to rebel anyway. So, you know, it, it, what we talked about a lot was, last week was the mindset. We got to have the right mindset. If we're going to choose to rebel against government authorities, we need the right mindset. And there, the mindset of the people in the Bible was not, well, I'm going to rebel, but first let me lawyer up and, you know, see what kind of angles we can have. And I, again, I said, I'm not against lawyers or anything like that. I, I'm, you know, good Christian lawyers. I'm all for, I fully support the ACLJ. I like them, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, so that kind of covers in a nutshell, what we talked about last week. Uh, any new thoughts on any of that, that, mm -hmm. so. So anyhow, take it seriously. We talked about, and it, and it, I mean, in King James uses the word damnation if you rebel against authorities. Now we look that up and it's basically a, a declaration that you're a criminal. So it may or may not be, it's probably not speaking of eternal damnation because that's totally based on what we do with Jesus. But it's still a pretty heavy hitting word. So, um, all right, so 16. <clears throat> <clears throat> As free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as servants of God. So being free in Jesus is not freedom to live as you want, but freedom to live as you ought. Uh, and that, uh, I got that once, I think we were, I was studying Galatians, and I looked up, it was for freedom that Christ has made us free or something to that effect. And that was one of the definitions that that came out of it when I looked it up. Freedom not to live as you want, but to live as you ought. Mm -hmm. So we are not, Peter is saying, we are not to use our freedom to live or justify living in a sinful manner. Uh, Peter's primarily Jewish audience may have been drifting towards the abuse of liberty which we talked about before. Um, if we live as servants of God, the only offensive things we will do will be regarding God's glory in Christ. So <clears throat> generally speaking, and this kind of goes back again to last week, generally speaking, true believers are good citizens. You know, uh, generally speaking, true believers are not causing a problem. Uh, I, I wonder if I can find it real quick. I like that one that I read uh, last week. Maybe I can't find it so quick. It was a commentator. Of course, I'm not going to find it quick. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so... Oh, I wish I could find it. It was kind of cool. But anyhow, so, oh, it was, it was, um, it was from the Roman commander, ancient Roman commander Pliny. And basically he said that these believers are great citizens. The only thing that we can find against them is their strange and perverse um, affection for their superstition or something like that. So basically this Roman commander in early or ancient Rome military said, there's nothing wrong with Christians except for their weird beliefs. Mm -hmm. You know, so we behave ourselves. Eh, the world just thinks we're strange in our beliefs. And we talked about, you know, how the world, the vast majority of the world honored Billy Graham. I mean, you know, uh, so God, Peter's telling us, uh, the Holy Spirit through Peter, telling us to live in a way that glorifies God. Mm -hmm. And usually, for the most part, that means do what you're told. 
for the most part. Um, there are exceptions. <clears throat> uh, and so the only offensive thing we will do will be regarding God's glory in Christ, which those examples we talked about from last week. <clears throat> um, compare uh, verse 16 here of uh, Peter 2 uh, with Galatians 5.13. For brethren, ye have, oh, here it is right here. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So, true freedom is being a servant of all. True freedom is not living the way you want. Eat, drink, be merry, party hardy, you know. Uh, I'm good, I got the blood of Jesus. You know, I live like the devil, but I got the blood of Jesus. No, yeah, no, nah. nah, it, it's scripture says in both covenants, the just shall live by faith. So if you've been justified, there's a way you live and is by faith. Doesn't mean perfect, but it means by faith. So. So the true liberty in Christ results in love and service to others, not selfish, carnal living. Mm -hmm. So again, Peter's addressing um, mainly Jewish believers, although not exclusively, who were scattered abroad throughout. And usually we looked at with the map, it's the north of, north of Israel, that kind of that, pretty much straight north. But over the area, Pontus, Galatia, whatever, I can't remember them all. But north of Israel, they've been scattered. And uh, <clears throat> they're starting to be affected by the liberty, the abuse of liberty that can happen with Christians. Um, so with Christians, we've got... Well, probably more, but for sure, two extremes. Uh, <clears throat> on the one hand, you've got the Pharisees, which uh, in Acts 15, it says, uh, and there was this, those amongst the sect of the Pharisees which believed. So these were believing Pharisees. These weren't the ones that were out to try and kill the believers, uh, at least not physically. These were ones that were following Jesus but they wanted to add the law of Moses back in. So uh, there are uh, Acts 15, I think it's verse 5, where it says they were, uh, there arose those amongst the sect, of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying to command them to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses. And then five verses later, it says... Uh, you know, uh, the apostles, it says, uh, uh, the, the, some preach things uh, subverting the soul, uh, that preach things that they ought not, subverting the souls, um, giving as commandments, things that we gave no such commandment. It ends with verse 10 uh, in Acts 15, uh, verse 10 to whom we gave no such commandment. So the Pharisees wanted the command keeping the law of the Moses. Five verses later, the apostles say, we never gave any such commandment. It's simple as that. But so you've got the one side, the legalists who want Jesus plus the law. And then you've got the other side of the pendulum, which says, once you got Jesus, you don't even ever have to believe again. You, you can live like Satan, you're still good to go. Uh, and the reality is, is the just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. So Peter's addressing, uh, the, at this point, he's addressing the side that may be swinging a little more towards uh, licentiousness instead of liberty. So the definition of liberty is to live as we ought, not as we want. Um, and it's for uh, Galatians 5, 13. It's um, not given occasion for the flesh, but by love serve one another. That's liberty. That's liberty, serving one another, not serving yourself.
Any thoughts on any of that? Um, actually, just um, back to that circumcision thing. Um, in church, we just were doing Ephesians. <clears throat> and in Ephesians um, uh, 2, it talked about um, talking to the Gentiles on who um, the Gentiles in the flesh who are uncircumcised by the so-called circumcised, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the circumcision is done by the hands, where circumcision is really of the heart. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, circumcision, another whole study there, but uh, in both the Old and the New Testament, uh, it speaks specifically of the circumcision of the heart mm -hmm. uh, in both covenants. So... That's the circumcision that matters, right. uh, and you know so, and so yeah, um, it's a heart issue, and that's what Paul is saying, Galatians five thirteen, and Peter's echoing here in uh, First um, Peter two sixteen. You know, it's um, you know don't don't let don't use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serving one another. So it's a it's a heart issue, uh, and it's the same thing with it's the same thing with in connection with submitting to authorities. It's a heart issue, you know. <clears throat> you know, oh that guy's a jerk. I'm not going to do what he says. Well, that sounds like a bad heart issue. The guy might be a jerk, and what he says to do it might be completely and totally wrong, but. What's your attitude like? You know, is your attitude completely and totally wrong too? You know, the old saying, two wrongs don't make it right. And uh, quite often when you stand on the truth of God's word, people will throw up the hypocrisy of others. And it's like, oh yeah, you Christians, you all preach and teach, blah, blah, blah. What about this guy who uh, was out sleeping with a prostitute? Well, I'll tell you what. I, I, you know, I don't love it that it happens, but I love it when they try and throw it in my face. Let me tell you what, that guy's going to stand before Jesus Christ and have to make an account for his sins. You're going to stand before Jesus Christ and make an account for your sins. And if you try and pull that nonsense with Jesus and say, what about this guy? Jesus is going to say, we're not talking about him. Now we're talking about you. How, why in the world should I let you into my heaven? Mm -hmm. You better add the right answer. So, you know, when they, because that's what's like, one of the tricks of the devil is always divert attention. Always divert attention. When you nail them down, they're going to divert attention. You know? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I was in, I was in a conversation with uh, someone just today about abortion and uh, online and, uh, well, you know, I, you know, uh, there's circumstances where abortion is medically necessary and blah, 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 like when the woman's life is in danger. So I pulled out the quote from uh, C. Everett Koop, former Surgeon General, 36 plus year pediatric uh, doctor, who said, in my 36 years of pediatric medicine, I have never once seen a single occasion where the woman's life is in danger or that abortion was necessary. So now the guy's diverting attention. What about this? You know, where I don't agree that that's a valid exception, but let's stop the 99.98% of other abortions and then we'll tackle that question. Mm -hmm. They don't want to do that. They don't want to know nothing about that. Um, you know, so they divert attention. Well, a woman should have a right to do with what she wants with her body. Divert attention. Well, that would be fine if the woman's uh, limbs were the ones being ripped off limb by limb and uh, poisons were being injected into her skull and spine. That would be fine if that's her decision, but it's not. No one, no one consulted the baby. And by the way, the baby is definitively a different person because the baby does not have the woman's DNA. The woman's lungs have her DNA. The woman's arms have her DNA. The woman's tears have her DNA. 
But the woman's, the baby in the womb has a different person's DNA. So one thing you got to be aware of when you're talking with people, if you, if you nail them down, they're going to divert attention and usually they throw up hypocrisy. I, I, don't, I don't let them get away with it. I don't let them get away with it because I have to make my account before God and you have to make yours. So I'll deal with Jesus for myself. I'm just here to tell you, you're going to deal with Jesus for yourself. He, Jesus isn't going to ask me about you. Uh -huh. He's going to address you. So, uh, but yeah, diverting attention, that, that, that happens all the time um, when, you, when you nail someone down. Uh, and so anyhow, yeah. I'm not sure how we got onto that, probably because I was dealing with it today. So, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, all right. So verse 17, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Some translations will say honor the emperor. Um, same difference, governing authority, but emperor is a whole lot more powerful than a king. Mm -hmm. You know, Israel at the time of Jesus had a king. He was just a puppet for the emperor, mm -hmm. King Herod. You know, the emperor was Caesar. So um, first thing we start out with is honor all people. Um, how do we do that? Respect. Respect, yeah. Um, just be nice. Yeah, being nice. Do unto them as you would have done unto Yeah, do unto them as you would have done unto, your, unto yourself. Yeah, all good answers. Um, to try, me... Try not to judge. Do uh, not judge. I, I, I don't necessarily go there. I let the Bible do the judging. I don't judge, right, right. you know. I mean, sometimes... Yeah, judge. yeah. Yeah, no, I get it. You know, you look at somebody and they look weird and, you know, well, judgment automatically flows. But, but when it comes to actual stated beliefs, policies, actions, then, you know, I let the Word of God judge that, you know. <clears throat> Thou shalt not murder, that takes care of abortion. So, you know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't make the judgment, I just repeated it, you know. So, uh, but, yeah, so to me, one of the, one of the greatest uh, demonstrations of honor and loving for people is to tell them the gospel. Mm. I mean, you know, love people enough to tell them the truth. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, it's like, I, you know, I, I don't want somebody walking away thinking they're okay because I was nice to them and not knowing the truth. Mm. I want them to know the truth and still think I was nice to them telling them the truth, you know. But I'm going to tell, first priority for me is the truth. Second priority is if I could possibly do it in a nice way. But like I said, most often they start throwing up the di attention, uh, attention diversions. And, and then if that doesn't work, they result in name calling and ad hominem attacks, which are the lowest form of debate and resorted to by those who are devoid of any substance. So... And of course, I tell them that too when they try and, you know, uh, try and pull that stuff on me. So, mm. and then next on that one is uh, so honor all people, all people, honor, okay? Uh, that doesn't mean embrace what they do right. or teach or, you know, whatever. I mean, uh, you know, the head of the Church of Satan, you know, I'm going to honor him as a human being. I'm not going to honor him as any kind of spiritual leader. I'm not going to honor his doctrines. I'm not going to honor his actions. You know, I'm going to preach the gospel to him. He's a human being, you know. I'm going to try to honor him in that manner. Uh, try to be nice if possible. Um, like it says, and so much as is possible with you, live at peace with all men. You know, of course, living in peace doesn't mean living in compromise. But uh, so uh, then honor all people. Then next is love the brethren. 
So we are supposed to love everyone, but specifically love the brethren. Uh, and this is, this is a familial love. It's beyond our love for the lost. It is love for the saved. So our love for the lost is intense or should be, you know, uh, because these are people who are going to eternal torment in hell without, if they continue to re reject Jesus throughout the rest of their life. Um, but our love for the brethren is more than that because now they're not lost sinners in need of a savior, which is intense, unbelievable love, but there are formerly lost sinners who embraced our Savior and are now brothers and sisters, so they're family. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, love the brethren is often more difficult than loving the lost mm -hmm. because as family, you know, we get on each other's nerves, you know. And, and that 100, well, I would say, 100% of the time, we are going to get on each other's nerves, given enough time. But that's, at, at, at that point, we don't like them, but true. we love them. True, true. You know, you, and, and the liking, loving, I mean, that kind of, a little bit depends on what the cause of the friction right. is, right. too, you know. Right. But the love is, is, is definitely mandated. Um, and again... With the lost, that's kind of easy in a way, because Christ is in us to love the lost, because they're lost and we know what to expect from them. Mm -hmm. Loving the brethren, when we're expecting certain, our expectation of godly interaction, which our expectation may be right or wrong, but we expect to interact as fellow believers, and one or both of us, the flesh gets in the way and we fail, well, now there's friction. Mm -hmm. And so that loving the brethren definitely, I think, is more difficult than yeah. loving the lost, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so that's the second thing. Then it says, fear God and honor the emperor or the, the honor of the emperor slash king. Mm -hmm. um, we're called to honor the king, but God alone is above all and he's to be feared. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, comparing with Romans 13, 7, which we talked about previously, it's Paul's lengthier uh version of what Peter's saying in these verses in these verses. But verse seven says, Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So here you got both of those, fear and honor, you know. Fear God, honor the king. Fear to whom fear is due, well Jesus I think it's Matthew eleven twenty eight tells the disciples privately. He says, "Don't fear him who can kill your body, and that's the end of it. There's the emperor, but rather fear him who can destroy the kill the body and destroy the soul in hell. There's God. Uh, you know, so so here we got Jesus, Paul, and Peter all in agreement, which of course is not surprising." Um, but God is greatly to be feared, and um, the king, the king or emperor, is to be honored. Is that the right verse? Eleven twenty-eight. No. What's it say? Uh, come to me. Uh, okay, right. ten twenty-eight. Okay. Oh yeah, here it is. Matthew ten twenty-eight. I knew it was one of those two. I I always get the wrong one. Yeah. So Matthew ten twenty-eight. Yes. Go ahead, and read it. Um, do not fear those who kill the body yeah. and are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. There you go, uh, Matthew ten twenty eight. 
So if anybody's watching the video at some point, we'll find out if they watch the whole thing, if they send me a note saying, oh, you got the wrong verse. <laughs> oh, you quit too soon. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there you go. Nobody's perfect. I just rubbed somebody the wrong way. So, okay, anyhow. So, um, fear to whom fear and honor to whom honor. So we're supposed to fear God and honor the emperor or the king. Uh, and the fear of the Lord is more than just reverence and awe. Um, you know, when you look up the definitions of the various Greek and Hebrew words, many of them include uh, phrases like dread terror. And so because, because we often limit the fear of the Lord to being nothing more than reverence and awe, we don't have the motivation, or we don't have as powerful a motivation to correct our ungodly living when we're living ungodly, because we just have this reverence and awe, no dread terror. Um, and so the, one of my Bible school teachers called it the inverted iceberg principle. Icebergs, 90% of the time you see, you see, you don't see 90% of it, it's under the water, 10% above. Well, he called it the inverted iceberg principle. 10% under the water and that's the dread terror. You don't see that and you don't live in that most of the time. 90% is the reverence and awe. That's where we should be living. You know, revering God, being in awe of God, you know, in his holiness, his awesome majesty and all that. That's where we should be living. But that dread terror needs to be there when we're not living in the reverence and awe and we should be terrified. You know, so um, so that that's another uh, another problem with much of the church. There's that parts of the church, not our church, but the church universal that teach there is no fear of God, you know, just reverence and awe. Mm -hmm. Well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So many, it's no wonder so many dumb people out there. <clears throat> you don't fear God. You don't even have the foundation for wisdom, according to the scripture. Job says that. It says it, in, I think, in the Psalms and it says it in Proverbs too. Mm -hmm. So... Um, the fear of the Lord is the foundation. It's the scripture says the beginning, but you look it up, it's the bedrock, it's the foundation of wisdom and, and knowledge and I think understanding. I think all three are ascribed at different places to the fear of the Lord. So um, <clears throat> he is to be feared. And uh, we just looked at what Jesus told the disciples privately, don't fear him who can kill your body, the emperor but rather fear him who can kill your body and destroy your soul in hell. Mm -hmm. That sounds pretty terrifying to me. And Jesus didn't say it to the crowds. He said it to his disciples privately. Mm -hmm. All right. If Jesus warned them to be afraid, I think it's probably a good idea to be afraid, you know, under the right circumstances, in the right situation, by the right understanding of scripture. Uh, you know, I don't walk around terrified that God's going to, swap me with a giant fly swatter or, or ping pong paddle or baseball bat or something. I don't walk around like that, but I do have the fear of the Lord. So, you know, it, it's it's all got to be balanced and in, in order. Um, Luke 20, 25 carries on. Jesus carries on with the same kind of idea. Um, and he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, give give according to whom it's due, you know. Yeah, we, talked, we mentioned it last week too. Yeah. And then John thirteen thirty five. <clears throat> By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. This is, um, and so that's the scripture in my note. Uh, this is a different manifestation of love than that for the lost, which we talked about. It is still agape love, but it's manifested differently. Jesus loved the world and died for it. Jesus loved his disciples and called them friends. You know, same love, mm -hmm. but different manifestations. Uh, you know, both 
infinite, unbelievable love, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Um, but a uh, couple things that, that jump out at me here that I've encountered at different times. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes, you know, Christians will say, well, you can't, you can't really tell if somebody's a believer or not. You know, I've heard that before. Well, wait a second. Jesus just says that the world will know we're his disciples by our love one for another. So if the world can know, how can we not know? You know, um, and it's, it's usually when you get into a discussion about uh, godless behavior or something like that. Well, you don't know what's in his heart. That's true. I don't. But I'll tell you what, you know, uh, if you behave like that, the world's probably not going to think you're a believer. You know, so, and this goes to what Peter's been talking about all along here is, you know, uh, live in a way that glorifies God. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're talking about here. And, and, and Jesus says that they'll know, that they will know we're his disciples by our love one for another. <clears throat> and, and this is is not sloppy agape this is not cotton candy agape love is god kind mm -hmm. of love and the phrase sloppy agape is usually you know not it's referring to cotton candy fluff love you know and and they, mm -hmm. it's it's not a bible word it's mm -hmm. it's english mm -hmm. that rhymes with the greek sloppy agape uh, and that's not what the Bible teaches. Paul loved Peter and the audience around them enough to get in Peter's face when Peter was distancing himself from the Gentile believers because Jewish believers showed up and Peter became a hypocrite. Paul publicly rebuked him uh, and said, how is it that you, Galatians 2, 11 and verse 11 and 14 in particular, how is it that you... Uh, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles, and now you're expecting the Gentiles to live like Jews. Basically, Paul loved Peter and the audience around him enough to get in his face and correct him. So love is not sloppy agape. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're seeing that now with the debacle at the Olympics, um, mm -hmm. you know, and we talked about that, I think, some last week. The bottom line for me is <clears throat> um, when, when the world makes a blasphemous mockery mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of my Savior, mm -hmm. I'm outraged. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, I love Jesus so much that I'm angry mm -hmm. when he's blasphemed and abused. On the other hand... I'm not going to, I don't advocate, never will advocate going out and getting vengeance on people and taking revenge and anything like that because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So there's two different dichotomies going on here. One, how do I respond to my Lord being blasphemed? And two, how do I respond to the degenerate sinners that are doing the blaspheming? Well, if I ever get to talk with any of them, they're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how I'm going to respond to them. Mm -hmm. uh, if there were anything legally I could do, mm -hmm. I would probably take legal actions. I would vote accordingly. Uh, and in November, I am going to vote accordingly to whoever is closer to my way of thinking. I'm not going to vote for someone who uh, stands on a platform that codifies in writing abortion. I'm not going to vote for someone who's comfortable with that because I believe that's murder. So, uh, you know, you got to vote. I vote for, for King Jesus. Yeah, well, I vote. I don't have to vote for him. Yeah, he's not asking for my vote. He's king anyhow. But I, I trust in King Jesus. I vote for whoever is more in line with his way of thinking. Um, 
because God has placed us in a representative republic and we have the right to vote. Not every believer has that right. So, uh, so anyhow. Um, yeah, so the agape love, it's it, same love manifested differently. Mm -hmm. Jesus died. He loved the world and died for it. He loved his disciples and calls us friends. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. All right, so on to the next section, uh, verses 18 through 20. Um, I call this section uh, a couple little uh, sub things I called it. Submit properly to our employers, which is the way kind of that I would look at it. Mm -hmm. um, and then obedience for God's glory. So those are mm -hmm. my two thoughts for this section. Um, so you want to read those uh, 18 sure. through? All right, Lisa, go ahead. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. forward. For this is thankworthy of a man for conscious toward to God endure grief, suffering and wrongfully, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you should take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. All right, so. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. There's the fear again, uh, but this one's now to the masters. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward or harsh or unjust. There we go again. We're back there, Peter. Um, so servants are to respectfully obey their masters no matter what they're like. Good and gentle or unjust. Yeah, all righty. Uh huh. So there, there's uh, <laughs> more stuff that we got to wrestle with and ask God for help because mm -hmm. none of us like that for sure. I told you different times in the past, there's parts of the Bible I don't like. Well, this would be one of them, you know, uh, no matter who he is, uh, you know. Uh, servants are to respectfully obey their masters, no matter what they're like, good or gentle or unjust. Uh, servants, in this case, is a uh, it's a different word from the word slave. A lot of times the Greek word for slave is translated as servant, and it could mean mm. bond servant. Slave could be like an indentured servant, something like this. This In this case, uh, it is a... Um, it is a uh, fellow, a fellow resident. In other words, a menial, a menial domestic, a household servant. Mm. So, uh, this is probably more like a hired servant. Right. You know, room and board, that kind of thing. Um, so it's it's it it's not as harsh a word as slave, uh, but you are, you know, menial labor. I mean, uh, it does, the definition does use menial and household servant. So you're a servant, you have a master, um, and, you know, but it, it's probably more of a paid kind of position, like hiring a maid if you got that kind of money or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so, respectfully obey your masters uh that's that's a key there uh you know um it's uh i think that remind me of the story where the the i think the father's kind of yelling at the young kid sit down you know or something like that and the kid's i'm standing sit down i said i'm standing and so finally, the father wins, and the kid sits down, and the kid says, I'm still standing inside, you know. So, yeah, we can obey, but respectfully obey. That is where we need God's help. <laughs> you know, whoever our masters are, our bosses, that's why I say our employers or our bosses, whoever, whoever God's placed over us, uh, as as some kind of a master, um, 
It's respectful obedience. Grudging obedience is obedience, but it doesn't glorify God because he knows what's in the heart. Um, you know, disobedience doesn't glorify God. Grudging obedience doesn't glorify God. The heart attitude glorifies God. So, you know, if God's put us in a place and, um, you know, it's his, well, like a job, it's his provision, what's our heart attitude, you know? Uh, and so, you know, that's something that, I mean, Peter's, well, I know he's talking to me, you know, because I often can complain about whoever, you know, uh, not so much my boss, but aspects of the job, mm -hmm. you know, particularly the pay or lack thereof, uh, you know. Easy slip. What? Easy slip. Easy to fall and slip on that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, an easy slip. Never heard yeah, easy. Yeah, that one's an easy one to slip on and gloss over when you can. Uh, but it's there. So, um, so slave. This the uh, slave is interesting. Again, I, I got something out of this. Slave. This word's used only five times in the Bible, uh, and here's a couple of examples. Uh, Luke 16, 13, no servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or, he, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And then Romans 14, 4, who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Yes, and he shall be held up, for God is able to make him stand. So those two other examples, this is the three of the third of five, uh, those two other examples, specifically the master is God. Um, and the servant is, uh, is, is, is us, and we need to choose who we're going to serve. Uh, so in Luke, choose, you can't serve two masters. You're going to love one and hate one. Uh, you know, so we got to choose who we're going to serve. You're going to serve somebody. There's no other choice. You're going to serve somebody. So choose who you're going to serve. You can't serve two masters. Um, and in, in these other two uh, passages, the master, the desirable master, is God. And in Romans 14, who are you to judge another man's servant? This That's the passage it's talking about. Uh, not keeping one day holy, you know, the Sabbath, uh, uh, or not, or eating unclean foods. Mm -hmm. Those are the two specific mm -hmm. things that are talked about in Romans 14. And, and uh, Paul writes, who are you to judge somebody else's servant? And then, you know, he goes on to say, you know, you know, one man eats only vegetables, another one eats whatever, you know, he wants. Uh, one esteems one day is holy unto the Lord. The other esteems every day is unto the Lord. Uh, you're doing it unto the Lord, do it, you know. So um, the master in both cases is God. Uh, which, we're going back to what Peter's repeatedly saying here through this chapter is we got to trust God because he's the master. He's the king of kings. He's the emperor of emperors. He's, he's the boss. So, yeah, we have bosses and masters over us in this world, but they have a master too that ain't nobody over him. So, the bottom line is our service is to God. And a few times in the past, I have told my bosses, I've said, look, I've said, and I literally told a couple bosses this. I said, as long as you don't have any, as long as you don't ask me to do anything immoral or illegal, you won't have anybody try harder than me. Because even though you're my boss, I work for Jesus. And I'm going to do my very best because he watches all the time. You can't. I said, 
And both those jo- both of the two that come to mind, both of them, I repeatedly got raises and elevated positions and stuff because they knew it was true. Mm-hmm. Because they saw it. They, they, they didn't have to uh, watch over my shoulder mm-hmm. because I did, as, with God's help, I did the best I could to, mm-hmm. I, I, said, I said, you might have people do it better than me because they have more skills or, or more training or something, but I don't think you'll have anybody work harder than me mm-hmm. because I'm working for Jesus. Mm-hmm. And it, it, if you're working for the Lord, there's no way you're going to be displeasing to an employer. Because if your employer says, drive that nail into the board, you're going to have it done before everybody else because you're doing it for, if you got the same skills, you know. So you can't possibly lose if you're doing it as unto the Lord. And, uh, so no matter what kind of master it is, and think about it, the people we talked about last week and briefly this week, uh, Daniel serving Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, he was by no stretch of any imagination, any kind of a godly man, you know. But Daniel, Daniel served him better than anybody else. Dreams. Yeah. Yeah. Interpreting the dreams, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego right behind him, you know, as top dogs. Joseph, I mean, no, to my knowledge, no one ever accused Pharaoh of being a righteous man. <laughs> now, he claimed to be a god, but I don't know of anybody who accused him of being a righteous man. Well, Joseph was second in charge of all the kingdom. Pharaoh could lay back on his couch and have people fan him because he knew he could trust Joseph. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the kind of people God wants. That's the kind of people Peter's encouraging his audience to be. Uh, <clears throat> and these guys were not, these masters were not nice masters. They, The godly people earned their favor by working for God and doing the best they could for God, you know, interpreting dreams, storing up goods for everyone in the whole world, the whole known world, saving all, essentially all of humanity through seven years of famine, the nation of Israel being birthed by them moving to Egypt, 70 people, leaving about 600,000 men, something like that. So God knows what he's doing. Our service is to God, even if it is via earthly masters, or or in our case, employers. Subject being subject to is uh, to to subordinate, to uh, reflexi- reflexively to obey. So, being subject to, in a in a very real way, is different than being a slave. <clears throat> A slave is forced to obey. One who subjects himself to chooses to obey. There's a difference. You can make people obey. You can't make them choose to obey. I mean, if it's a matter of life or death, you know, most people are going to make the forced choice. Yeah. Yeah. Don't like that death option, so I'll do it. You know, I don't like that whip option, so I'll do it. I don't like you know whatever other tortures they might come up with, so I'll do it. But that's not really a choice. Being subject to is a choice. So again, it it, it, it ties in with um, the respectfully obedient. Well, if you're subject to, you'll be respectfully obedient. If you've been forced. You probably be obedient, but not necessarily the um, respectfully part. Mm-hmm. Uh, and masters, by definition, this is interesting because uh, the two references we just talked about, God is the master in both of those cases. By definition, uh, masters is uh, despotes, 
which is where we get the word despots from. Yeah, the Greek word mm -hmm. is despotes, uh, an absolute ruler, mm -hmm. a despot. And God applies it to himself a couple of times. And, uh, and, and in this, actually more than a couple, but two that we talked about, uh, out of the five. And in this passage, uh, you know, it, it says, Master, mm -hmm. whether he's good and gentle mm -hmm. or harsh and unjust, mm -hmm. you know. So God applies this absolute authority, absolute rule part to himself. Now, uh, certainly he's not a despot the way that we understand the definition of the word despot, but absolute ruler, you know, he is. And such masters can be, he's not, but can be evil. And uh, so... Fear, uh, fear them, by definition, to be put, here, here's one of the words, to be put in fear, alarm or fright, be afraid, exceedingly fear, terror. So that's one of the words we were talking about, where the definition of the word fear includes the aspects of terror, mm -hmm. you know. And I, that's another, uh, let's see, do I, let me finish this before I maybe go off for a second. Yeah, let me finish this, and then we'll see about the terror thing. Um, <clears throat> froward or unjust. So just to give an idea of whether they're good and gentle or unjust, the definition of that word is warped, uh, winding figuratively, winding figuratively perverse, crooked. So we're supposed to respectfully obey warped, perverse, and crooked masters. Again, Daniel, Joseph, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their masters fit those fit this definition. Uh-huh. Yeah, I probably have had some that fit that definition too. Um, so we're back to square one. Do we trust God? Or do we run for the hills? You know, I have a friend now who's working a job that by and large she hates. And but so far, God hasn't given her the green light to leave. So she's doing the best she can. And it's uh, has ungodly aspects to it. And um, she just tells him, I'm not doing that, you know. Hoping maybe that they'll fire her, but uh, they won't. They won't because she's a good worker. So far, they haven't. You know, so they feel their pain. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, that's the kind of masters. The flip side, the bad side of the kind of masters we're supposed to be obedient to respectfully. So one commentary. Uh, the command to submit to masters isn't just to those who work for masters that are good and gentle, but also for those who are harsh. Mm -hmm. If we must endure hardship because of our Christian standards, it is then commendable before God. So uh, we'll get on. We're going to leave it at that for tonight to start next week on verse 19. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, just to the terror aspect, I'm going to go because I, I think many of us are only partially uh, motivated to preach the gospel. So let me see if I can find it here. Seven and eleven. It must be Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians five, I believe. And of course. All right, so 2 Corinthians 5, da, 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 am I in the right place? No, uh, 
I am in the right place, just not the right, uh, yeah, 11 and 14. 2 Corinthians 5, 11 and 14. <clears throat> um, verse 11, most of us know verse 14. Verse 11 says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made, are made manifest in your consciences. So Paul's detailing two motivations here in, this, in these couple verses. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We need to know God is absolutely holy. Mm -hmm. And... You know, uh, no, zero sin will ever dwell in his presence. Zero. And the terror of the Lord is eternal torment in hell. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that is a motivation that many of us, many of us lack, is knowing the terror of the Lord. Uh, and unfortunately, we have popular doctrines these days that say hell is not eternal torment. Mm -hmm. Lots of people are starting to embrace Jehovah's Witness doctrine of annihilationism, uh, even many so-called Christians, mm -hmm. which of course makes God rather unholy because now the blood of Jesus and the annihilation of the sinner are equal payment for his sin debt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, folks, eternity in hell is not good enough to pay your debt. Mm -hmm. All of eternity in hell leaves you lacking paying the debt. That's why it's time to embrace Jesus. Uh, so knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's the part that most people uh, ignore or are un unaware of. Verse 14, 2 Corinthians 5, 14. So that one was verse 11, uh, three verses later. For the love of Christ constrains us. That's the one we all know. Everyone knows, for the love of Christ constrains me. You know, we preach the gospel because Jesus loves us. He loves you. I know that. You, and so we move that way. Well, if we're only motivated by love and we don't know the terror of God, we're not fully motivated. And I heard, you can look this one up for the details, but I heard once an evangelist probably hundreds of years ago in England, uh, preached the message to an atheist and preached the gospel. And the atheist said to him, uh, my good man, if I believed what you just preached, I would crawl across the length and breadth of all of England over broken glass on my hands and knees to tell that message to just one person. If. Yeah, he didn't believe it. He didn't believe it, but that message. So the, in other words, the preacher was fully motivated by the terror of God and the love for that guy. But the atheist, and I think we have some people now who are atheists, I'm, I'm not going to mention because I'm not 100% sure, but one name comes to mind, um, who is more right on with understanding the terror of the Lord that he doesn't believe in than many Christians. Mm -hmm. And so that really, that I heard that story when I was in Bible school and it spoke to me many times over the years. Do I really understand the gospel and the, and the seriousness of it? Because that atheist said, if I believe what you preach, all across all of England, over broken glass, on my hands and knees, just to tell that message to just one person. Mm -hmm. That's how serious we need to take it. Mm -hmm. So, having said that, we're starting next week with verse 19. Thanks for joining us. Take care. God bless. And Lord willing, we'll see you next week.